You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Welcome to an INCJ podcast on YouTube. I'm John Scott, and this is number two in a series we're calling the COVID Leadership Challenge. Now, obviously, COVID-19 is presenting a unique challenge to frontline workers, not just in the health and social sector, but in criminal justice too. And at INCJ, we wanted to find out how leaders internationally were handling the issues around COVID-19. So what we've done is start a conversation with leaders to ask about their experience in the crisis. Now, if you want to follow this series, you'll find it on our website, which is at criminaljusticenetwork.net, or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network. Now, second up in this uh, series, let me introduce Edith Turge, uh, who is the Executive Director of the European Forum for Restorative Justice. Now, welcome, Edith. Uh, how about you tell us where you're based, first of all? Where are you? Hi, John, and thanks for this conversation. Um, right now, I'm in Leuven. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, where our organization uh, is situated, and I'm in our office, uh, where I try to come time to time. Um, and sometimes we are even with two colleagues in the office. So. Oh, right. So now that's Leuven in Belgium. Yes. Now, my, I've been there, and it's the most beautiful uh, university uh, is it a town or a city? Town, I would say, with around 100,000 inhabitants, yeah. Yeah, but a beautiful place to be recommended. Um, and you're in the office. Um, do you sometimes work from home as well? Yes, uh, I try to combine um, this. In March, it was very difficult that we were not allowed to come to the office at all. Mm -hmm. So that was quite challenging. And um, since the beginning of summer, we are allowed to come back to the office with a reduced number of, of um, colleagues in the office in the same time. Okay. So, and, and it's quieter at the office, is it? It's super quiet, yeah. Except you <laughs> might hear the Leuven bells next to yeah. me oh, uh, right. on, the, on the square, but... Um, Otherwise, okay. if, if, if we hear the bells, we'll know that the time is passing. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks very much for agreeing to this conversation. And I'm hoping that your coffee is, your coffee is probably going to be better than mine because it'll be Belgium. Okay. First of all, you perhaps need to explain what the European Forum does because it's a bit of a long title. So tell us, you know, introduce the forum to our listeners. So the European Forum for Restorative Justice is, is a network uh, mm -hmm. of uh, professionals uh, with a European scope, and our main mm -hmm. aim is to, to develop restorative justice. Um, our membership uh, consists of, of researchers, practitioners, uh, policymakers, criminal justice professionals, students uh, who are interested or are working in restorative justice. Mm -hmm. um, we have a membership of about uh, 400 individuals and 80 organizations, mostly from Europe, but we also have members from, from all over the world. And um, for the membership, we provide services, organize events, uh, trainings. Um, we do a lot of dissemination of, of information on, on uh, research outcomes, projects, events. And uh, we also try to engage more in policy-related work. Um, we work uh, with the Council of Europe, with uh, the European Commission mm -hmm. um, and the UN also to move uh, restorative policies forward. We also try to to help practice development. Uh, we do research projects or, or rather pilot projects in partnerships with other uh, organizations. Uh, and we try to raise awareness on restorative justice in general. So mm. in a, a nutshell. Okay. Yeah. Is there a particular reason that you're based in Leuven? Yes, it, uh, it has to do uh, with our history. Um, mm -hmm. We celebrate our 20th anniversary this year, which um, actually not going uh, to be the party we planned for sure. Um, but the reason is that uh, 20 years ago, um, or even before, 
there was already a cooperation between uh, mostly academics and practitioners interested in uh, restorative justice and victim offender mediation mm -hmm. through a European project. And then they wished to continue this cooperation in a more formal way. And that's how they set up uh, uh, the forum. Um, and the leader of, of that uh, initiative was Professor Ivo Artsen, who is, he was at that time a professor in Leuven at the Catholic University of Leuven. So they took the lead to, to establish the organization. And then uh, still today, our offices are within uh, the buildings of KU Leuven. And we have a lot of cooperation with the research line on restorative justice here and, and with other colleagues from the Institute of Criminology, but also from the Faculty of Social Sciences and other departments. And your forum brings together people with very different backgrounds so that you have people from, with different professional backgrounds, uh, psychologists and lawyers and uh, probation officers and people work in prisons. Um, so you're... Uh, a network that that brings people together with different perspectives. I, again, I understand that right, yes? Yes, exactly. And I think that's a very big asset of the forum that, that uh, we are really proud of this diversity. And also we find it really important to bring these different professional backgrounds uh, together, to bring different areas together, because what we see that very often there is a gap between research and, and how research findings are actually translated into practice or how research really reflects the actual needs of practice mm. and how all this influences policy. So I think our main role is to, to, to bridge the gap uh, between these fields and areas. Okay, so 2020 actually represents a real challenge to you because if your job is to bring people together, you know, to bridge that gap, how, how is your organisation having to change because of COVID? Well, I think it's an extremely challenging year and, and yeah. that's also a question if our main aim is to bring together people. And, and actually that's what we, we chose as, as our slogan for our 20th anniversary, that we are bringing oh, together no. people since uh, 20 years. But uh, yeah, how we do it now as we cannot mm. meet physically and we cannot organize the events we planned, it's, it's extremely difficult. Mm. So, so what have you done to keep that idea of getting people exchanging ideas and perhaps meeting uh, in a different way. Yeah, of course, we we switch to too many online meetings and to organize or work um, in the office uh, in a different way, but also to provide platforms for people to to exchange challenges these days. But also, uh, all our working groups and committees uh, started to to have more frequent online meetings. Of course, we had to organize our general meeting online. So we create spaces um, to meet mm -hmm. virtually. And um, we also started a blog, uh, which, which was collecting experiences of people in the field about, uh, about COVID and how it affects their work. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called Solidarity in Distance. So we try to, to provide a platform um, to share not only um, on the general topics we are busy with, but also on the challenges COVID posed to, to our field. Okay. Well, well, I'm really interested to come back to that issue about what difference it's made for practitioners. So we'll hold on to that lovely title for the, for the blog, by the way. I'm hoping other people might, might want to go and visit that later. Um, but what's your biggest challenge for you as a leader, what's what you know? What's been difficult for you as a leader during the last uh, eight months or so? Um, I can list many. I think so. It's difficult to <laughs> to point to to the most uh, challenging uh, aspect of my job. But oh, I think we're breaking. But I think I think moving everything online was was really challenging in a way to reorganize our meetings, to reorganize our way of coordinating uh, projects. 
and we were really used to being in the office, sharing ideas. Uh, it was really a creative energy in the office, which which is not completely gone, but <clears throat> very very difficult to maintain when you don't see the colleagues, when you don't share ideas. So mm -hmm. on the level of the team, I think, <coughs> sorry, that's, okay. <clears throat> that's really a challenge, um, how we keep mm -hmm. that type of co-creation and, and teamwork alive and everybody is sitting in their home and, and, and we are not connected physically. Um, so that's, that's about coordination, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is, yeah, for the is organization. It also, is, it, is it also, sorry, is it also about how you work in a different way as a leader? So um, have you had to have different contacts with individuals in your team? Exactly. So, so I think we still didn't find really a way when we come together to discuss things or just to have a brainstorming or mm -hmm. we have a lot of contacts on, on, on daily tasks or, or ideas and, and uh, feedback on things. But, but that kind of creative energy, I cannot really um, explain it differently, but but that kind of inspiration we get from each other, it's it's uh, it's more difficult to maintain in these circumstances. Challenges with with turning or office life online is that uh, that uh, I have I have contacts with colleagues uh, individually, and we discuss things and they try to give feedback, but but that kind of creative. Uh, co-creation or creative energy in the mm. office, the inspiration from each other, or even just to share things, you know, what you do in the office uh, by a coffee or so that, mm -hmm. that helps you to move forward with, a, with an idea or a task is, is, um, is more difficult to create or, or, or it's not there anymore. Mm. And the other thing is the uncertainty. And I think uh, it's really difficult to cope with uncertainty uh, also for the coming period. Um, we had to cancel, postpone or, uh, or international conference that we organize mm. every two years. And it's really a big event for our community and for us as well. Um, not only for the contents, but also we know from the feedback and, and, and from being there that, that it's a moment for the field to meet and be together and it's a very social event. So, of course, we couldn't do this this year, but we also think about can we, can we responsibly start to organize it for next year? Mm. Um, it's it's really uncertain what we will be able to offer and do next year. While we really want to offer moments to our members to come together and to 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 have this uh, opportunity to to share and discuss and and learn from from each other. Mm. So the challenge is that it could have long-term effects that you've missed this big set piece opportunity for, for people to come together. And that's uh, an inspirational and encouraging event for the whole sector. Um, and that uncertainty has big knock-on effects. I, I get that. Okay. Um, what worries have your members brought to you about the impact of COVID-19? Well, of course, we heard a lot of personal stories, which mm. which uh, which are are difficult to 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 absorb or to contain. And mm. on another on another way, it's also very encouraging to see that members would share these with with the European network or or colleagues from a European network and mm. and find some kind of support. Mm -hmm. in in at least uh, listening to them on the professional level of course uh, restorative justice is a method where we bring people together normally physically we engage them in a conversation so mm -hmm. it is very difficult to to do this online or very difficult uh, to know what is safe uh, 
there are some methods when you normally pass a talking piece, but is it safe these days mm. to pass a piece uh, from each other's hands and then very small details of of um, of the actual practices <clears throat> which mm. can be done or not done in a safe way? Um, mm. There are initiatives to to follow practice online and there were a lot of discussions uh, pros and cons of that so it's also interesting to experiment with this this was not really used uh, at least in Europe uh, for conducting restorative meetings and it certainly has some potential um, but we all agree it shouldn't become the norm because okay. there are a lot of elements like like for example, the impossibility to to make eye contact uh, yeah. this way um, <clears throat> really makes the practice and the dynamics of a restorative meeting very different. Um, there were also concerns about um, about uh, cases of antisocial behavior, like in many countries, especially young people who 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 couldn't comply with the rules of the confinement and so on. And in some countries, these are dealt with, with criminal justice uh, measures. Um, we really believe, and, and there were countries who really offered restorative processes in these cases as, as, as a way to, to support more pro-social behavior and, mm. and really see and discuss the responsibility each of us has to to prevent uh, the escalation of, of, of this pandemic. So um, those were concerns. You mentioned mm -hmm. your blog, uh, and I'm wondering whether you have illustrations of innovative ways that practitioners have responded to COVID-19. Um, for me, it was really interesting to see how many practitioners offered their skills to help um, in the community. So mm -hmm. I don't speak about criminal justice uh, as such here, but mm -hmm. more mediators um, in Spain, in Estonia, in Italy, who offered their facilitation skills to, to sit down with doctors, nurses, families who lost their loved ones, okay. um, and, and do circles and, and do talks about what happened and it's not necessarily about res, res, uh, responsibility but more about how people experience these times and see each other's perspective and and try to come into terms with with what happened or the extreme pressure on them and so on mm. so i think these this can be i think very very valuable skills that that the restorative justice field can offer to societies Okay, so they were transferring their um, mediation skills into helping people cope with the aftermath of loss? For example, or, yeah. or, um, or for teams who couldn't meet and then came back together at some point or in school yeah. settings uh, to start with some kind of uh, reflection, common reflection and talk about how everybody lived uh, the confinement months. Uh, it was and it was a challenge for all of us and mm. and um, what is really interesting also for me in this whole situation that this is a global experience. Mm -hmm. So we can really connect to each other's experience. Uh, both on on the work level and or, on individual level, uh, and I think many restorative practitioners really saw this as a call to to offer their skills and offer restorative ways to to help people um, express their concerns or express their their difficulties, but also to to share it in a safe way and then then find support in each other. Mm. I was wondering in communities that I have heard that there's been friction about those that are very tough on regulations and those that want to be relaxed. And I wondered whether there was a, a neighborhood mediation role 
for restorative justice thinking? Um, I'm 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 sure these uh, these happened and and uh, now I cannot recall any example I'm aware of, but. Um, um, a member of us, Jan Marder, started um, um, mostly conversation with practitioners from all over Europe, where where we shared um, regularly uh, what happens on the field, where they offer uh, their services, what are the areas they they focus on, and and I think it's really difficult to to start a discussion on on these um, approaches to to following measures or mm. or 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 being against it's also an individual coping mechanism or so yeah, yeah. but setting up spaces to be able to to talk about this and express concerns are, are really valuable I think because otherwise these tensions are not uh, getting anywhere. Mm. Certainly neighbourhood approaches seem to me uh, on the ground the best way of resolving tensions. Okay, I want to move uh, a little bit to ask about you as a person and, uh, and as an organisation. Um, has anything made, has this crisis made you rethink your approach to work? Hmm. <laughs> Well, I think I learned a lot about uh, online tools for sure. Um, <laughs> and I think it confirmed how much work offers us a sense of normality. Mm. So I think I was really happy that, that I didn't have to stop working. Uh, we could, uh, we didn't have to give up any, any jobs here. So, so we mm. could, we could save the team in a way and we could continue our work. And I think that's, that's a privilege that, but not everybody could mm -hmm. do in this, in this period. I learned also how much I can trust my colleagues. Yeah. And, and I think it confirmed um, that, that we have a really great team and very, very responsible and, and knowledgeable people in the team and also, uh, in our membership whom we can trust and and whom we can count on so that was that was a lesson i learned and that's that's really positive i think um i think i have to develop in in my coordination skills as a leader and um uh, and that's something i i wish to focus on so one more thing i i wanted really to mention regarding practices uh -huh. and, and that was really impactful on me uh, to learn how much in Northern Italy, which was really mm -hmm. hardly hit by COVID and there were a lot of uh, fatalities and, and families having their family member taken to the hospital and never heard anything back. They couldn't mm -hmm. keep contacts. Uh, really, really emotionally difficult situation in 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 thousands of cases and what happened that relatives who who lost their loved ones started criminal proceedings against the doctors mm. the hospitals uh, but also the administration whoever was responsible of not handling the situation well so mm. there are now thousands of criminal files um and I'm not sure that the criminal justice system can really deal with these issues. There was even a call for, for the European Union to, to consider these as kind of crimes against humanity. So I think there is a strong need in, in victims in this sense to, to find some kind of closure or find some mm -hmm. kind of uh, responsibility for for what happened at uh, some level, but I think criminal justice is not really uh, well placed for that. And from restorative professionals from the area came the idea mm. of setting up a kind of truth commission, mm. which would enable people to tell their stories, also uh, 
also the doctors, uh, also managers of hospitals, also uh, managers of, of um, the whole public administration, mm. uh, and think about what could have been done differently or, or are there responsibilities, but in a constructive way, because I think punishment in any case wouldn't help uh, anybody. And mm. I don't think criminal responsibility can be really established in these cases, but still something has to be offered for all these uh, relatives. And really I, I speak about thousands of families mm. who seek answers to their questions. Yes, yeah, so a restorative justice approach rather than a punitive criminal justice approach um, in, a, in, a, in what is a health civil tragedy has really strong resonance with me. Um, I think that's, uh, that's a really powerful point and uh, uh, it won't bring those, those people back either, will it, to, to, to push a, a criminal button rather than a restorative button. Well, that's a very powerful point. But I think uh, it also well, shows, sorry, that no, that's no, okay. how much as a society we, we cannot really offer other way than, than criminal justice or, mm. or, or legal ways to, to deal with such emotions and such yeah. losses. And, and if they took a civil suit and, and, and tried to get money to uh, sue, to say, this has hurt us so much, we want money back from the system, well, that just... Um, means that the crisis will be handled even worse next time because people will be defensive. So let's go back to how, the, will the forum go back to the way it always was? Um, do you think that after the crisis, it'll just be the same? If, if I'm really optimistic, I would say it will be better because okay. we can have our... our bringing people together, activities back while we learned a lot about how we can offer moments of exchange while uh, not traveling uh, so much. Mm. And that's, that's a new, new way of working, which, which opened up. So I hope that we will be uh, the same, but I mm. hope that we will be able to offer much more than, than we, we did uh, before uh, the mm -hmm. pandemic. Oh, well, that, that's, that's, that's optimistic. Let's hope that that's true. Has the lockdown changed you as a person, Edith? Hmm. Of course, but it's difficult to say how, I think. Um, mm. I think during the lockdown, I just really enjoyed uh, kind of slow down. Mm. Um, I could really live without the morning hustle of uh, getting dressed and getting my kid to school and, and <laughs> say, I think that was, that was a really nice part of, of, um, of working from home. But um, I also, you just realize how much you are, you are a, a, a social animal. So how much contact with people mean, mm in our everyday lives and 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 I think for me that's essential. So I don't think I would be able to to live without that for for a long time. And and then I think about prisoners or, or think about uh, mm. any kind of confinement. It 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 makes me so much empathetic with with offenders in, in these uh, situation for example. Mm. So so I think, I think, yeah, what I learned as a person is that human contact is essential. Mm. And if you're deprived of it, that that's, brings you up short and makes you think about uh, people who are deprived of their freedom, either because of crime or because of injustice or whatever is, uh, is, a, is a harsh lesson, isn't it? Yeah. Um, have you found time to do any extra reading while you've been in lockdown? <laughs> if you mean bedtime stories, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right. So uh, you're, 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 you're ch ch reading children's books improved. Yeah, well, sure. Um, I mean, that was the main difficulty for me to to try to work from our 
tiny home actually with with mm. a five year old kid around. That's mm. that's mm. not ideal. So that I I wouldn't wish for anybody. I think that's. I mean, work life balance is is always a challenge. But when you are in the same space, I think it's mm. basically almost impossible. Mm. So mm-hmm. yeah, not not. Uh, I, it was also interesting that some colleagues started to bring up topic as boredom and for me it was just <laughs> the out of the question so so you so you, you you haven't read war and peace during the break lockdown. no not 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 i mean i'm i'm happy i could read some books uh, in the past uh, months mm. but uh, that's not my main activity or my okay. memory of the lockdown period <laughs> it's just children's books you've become an expert children's in. books yeah that's excellent. One of the things I've asked people is, have you got a challenge for the other leaders? Uh, is there something that you've really thought was the toughest challenge for leaders during this time? Oh, I can hear the bells in the distance. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. That's an interesting question. But I think... If I think about European networks uh, mm. as we are, I think I think the biggest challenge is really um, how how to remain connected with your field and how to remain mm. connected with with your network in these circumstances. And if I want to be more general, how to cope with uncertainty? Mm. So it's, I think living with uncertainty is is something that we. We we try so hard to be in control, don't we? And so when we have this level of, you know, international uncertainty and then personal uncertainty all the time, is is really unsettling. So I think that's 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 a that's the a really big challenge. So um, we'll we'll throw that at our colleagues in 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 the rest of this series. Um, have you got any COVID nineteen advice for your members? Like uh, practical things, you mean, or, or anything? Just <laughs> anything. your 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 sign off advice. Um, I think just um, just that you remain sane. <laughs> right, <laughs> in a monster madness, you stay sane. I think. I mean, that may be my most important advice. Yeah. Well, that seems to me. You keep steady, keep saying. That sounds like a really good place to end. Uh, Edit, thank you so much for sharing uh, your insights with us and absolutely fascinating to um, think through where restorative justice is at the moment. And it's just lovely of you to, to spend this time. Um, we're going to sign off, off now. So everybody, whether you're on a YouTube or a podcast, thanks very much for joining us and listening. Um, we hope that you stay safe uh, and we hope to see you next time. So with a final thank you to Edit, uh, goodbye. And remember that you can join our podcast on your normal provider of our iTunes and Google. And goodbye from INCJ. Cheerio. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.